Hi Ian, welcome to this month's Hadley Matters. I'm Sharon Howard, my producer to my right, Jane Nevin Smith. We always have to give a shout out to Diane who came Nevin Smith who came up with the name Hadley Matters because it does matter. And there are many matters. I have the great joy today of introducing someone who will make you believe what you heard in kindergarten. Police are your friends. Now most of us have moved away from that position, I suspect, given the experience of the lives. But this is a man who's going to change us back. <laughs> this is Mike Mason, Chief of Police in Hadley. And we have with us today a congregation, an audience of five Hadley residents. What we're going to do is kind of an overview and a little bit about Mike's personal life and some of the issues in Hadley. And then we're going to open it up if you have questions. So if you don't mind holding them. On the other hand, if they're pertinent in that moment and you're like me and can't remember them for five minutes, feel free to let us know that you have a question. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. Oh, would you like to stand up and twirl for us? Yeah, I'm Look glad at this. you dressed up for this affair. <laughs> well, this is what I always wear for you. Yeah. Um, no, I'm actually, uh, I have to um, leave uh, right at 4 o'clock, if that's all right, because I, uh, I have to give a speech at uh, the Acad Police Academy graduation uh, at 5 o'clock in Chicopee. We have one officer graduating uh, for Hadley, and... Uh, I am the president of the Western Mass Chiefs of Police Association, and of course the president has to uh, not only give a short speech, but I also have to administer the oath of office to all of the graduating officers. So, uh, that's Congratulations my jacket country. and my cover are in the car uh, for when the officers <laughs> come pick me up, and off we go. I tried to make him wear his full dress hat and everything. He said he'd sweat himself into a puddle, <laughs> <laughs> so he declined the honor. <laughs> But we have to tease him a little bit about his being in full full uniform, although not full dress, I guess. Right. Okay. Uh, Mike, what we're going to do is kind of an overview of your department's place in the Hadley structure, mm -hmm. your department itself, what it's about, something mm -hmm. about your personal life, sure. and something about the issues here in Hadley. Mm -hmm. And we will have time for questions, either during, which I say is okay, or after. Sure. Hello and welcome. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, you're... Kevin. Kevin Hi, Kevin. Hi. This is Mike Mason, Chief of Police. Hi. Hi, Chief. And those are Hadley folk. <laughs> okay, why don't we start with your department's place in the whole Hadley town structure. Sure. Who's your boss? Sure. Well, uh, my overall bosses are the select board, so all the members of the select board. I have a... Uh, liaison for the select board that is assigned to every uh, department in town has a liaison, a specific select board member that's assigned to our department. Um, right now that's Joyce Chungalo uh, and my direct supervisor who acts as kind of a liaison between our department and the select board so they don't have to hear every single thing that happens and goes on is Carolyn, the t new town administrator, or fairly new town administrator. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Um, so uh, right now, the way that our uh, the way that our structure is set up, at least internally, wh what we've been trying to do is working with the fire chief. Uh, we have a dispatch department, our police department, a fire department, and now we have uh, medics uh, who work for Action Ambulance, and we're all working out of the same building. What for too long over the years we have kind of had separate. It, it's felt too separate, too separated, where we have a dispatch department and then police and then fire, and we all kind of do our own thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was hired uh, about seven years ago, the fire chief and I decided that we were going to make a change. We were going to, we wanted to make sure that the folks in town uh, looked at all of us as a department of public safety as mm -hmm. opposed to just separate agencies. And so that's what we've been trying to do for quite a long time. And we found that uh, we work very well together and having everyone kind of have that common goal of public safety is uh, it's it's not only rewarding in and of itself, but it really kind of brings you know a boost to morale to uh, to all the dispatchers, all the officers, and all the firefighters. Does that um, change into a public safety department have feet to it 
I mean, it's not just that now we've all decided this, but you meet. Yeah, we not only do we meet, but we also uh, <coughs> sit down and work on budgets together. We try to consolidate and combine certain things. As everybody knows, we try to save money wherever we can. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's multifaceted, and we look from not just finance, but also from po from uh, points of policy, from uh, standard operating procedures, and things like that. And so it really kind of flows throughout the entire organization. Um, and, uh, you know, if you just take dispatch as an example, the dispatchers in our agency dispatch for police, fire, and our medical. So uh, we need to make sure that we kind of give them uh, a more structured way to be able to do things so it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like they have to dispatch a car accident, for example. A car accident requires police, fire department personnel, and medical personnel. Okay. If they were dispatching all of us separately, that would take forever. So we have to kind of really we have to really drill down on how we do things, and uh, and it's uh, it's been working well for us. So it sounds as though there are certain kinds of calls that would involve all three of oh, the other. Oh, absolutely. And there are some that might not, that would be just police or just... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it really kind of varies, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the police and the fire departments really go to a lot of the same calls together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because oftentimes, even if it's a dangerous situation, say uh, a person reported to have a weapon or something mm. like that, the fire department and the medics can't be far behind in the event that somebody gets injured. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is we'll ask them to do what's called staging. So they will respond, but they will stay a safe distance back while the police handle the call. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I can't think of a lot of calls where only one department is running out the door to go to it. I know I live in Green Leaves and I know that uh, we have a fire truck that ar arrives and an, an, an ambulance always arrives with it and uh, my understanding is that they have to have the ambulance when the fire truck is called out. Yeah, um, they. I'm not certain that, uh, that the fire chief requires it but mm -hmm. for 99.9% .9 of the calls where the firefighters are going they're going to, they're needing, you know, requiring their EMT skills and things like that sure. so you would always want to send that higher level of training, paramedics or something like that. So they Good. generally respond together. Good. How about the police department itself for structure? Tell me how many you've got, what level they are. So we have about 15 full-time officers. Well, we have space for 15 full-time officers. We do have some <laughs> vacancies right now. Uh, and we generally have between five and 10 part-time police officers that work with us as well. Uh, we have um, six, f I'm sorry, five full-time dispatchers and then about 10 part-time dispatchers who cover um, wow. any of the open shifts. What we've been trying to do is, is things are getting so busy that we are finding that we're needing two dispatchers on duty a lot of the time. Wow. Um, so we use part-time personnel to kind of uh, add to those mm -hmm. shifts where we're short. Um, the way the structure is set up for the police department is, as the, I'm the chief of police, I have a lieutenant who is in charge of operations. Many of you probably know him, extremely tall, blonde-haired guy, Mitch Cook. Um, Mitch uh, is in charge of essentially everything operations related within the agency. We have four sergeants right now. We have uh, one assigned to every shift. We have day shift, evening shift, and midnight shift. And then we have one sergeant who covers days off, we, the officers work at what they call a four on and two off schedule. So their days off kind of rotate throughout the week. Okay. And that fourth sergeant covers those days off for the evening and the midnight uh, shift officers because uh, those generally the busier, the busier of the shifts. Okay. Uh, and the patrol officers kind of fill in around that and we try, right now we have the staffing to have three police officers on every shift. When I say staffing I mean that's how many spots we have open for officers. Unfortunately, um, we've had uh, a drastic number of police officers leave in a very short period of time to go to other departments, so we have three vacancies right now. Oh. As I mentioned, uh, we're going, I'm going to a graduation for one of our officers in an hour, and he's been in the police academy for the last six months, so that's four vacancies. Uh, and then, you know, you always have, with, in, uh, with public safety work, policing or firefighting, you have injuries. And I have two officers that were out injured for two plus months at the same time. Uh, one of them was, was kicked by someone on a call and sprained his ankle. The other one actually didn't get hurt on duty, thankfully. He fell skiing or something <laughs> like that. 
So you have to you have to fill in these fill in these gaps, and so those are the those are kind of the struggles that we're dealing with right now. But um, we also have a canine officer. I'm sure by now you've probably met the dog, and if not, we'll make sure we bring him by. Uh, we have a school resource officer. Uh, we've ha unfortunately had to sh shuffle through a couple of different ones because those were a couple of officers who did leave us uh, for for uh, other departments. And uh, generally speaking, traffic. Uh, larcenies, thefts from all of our stores uh, is kind of the highest volume of calls that we get throughout the year. You talked uh, with me also about the traffic here, that mm -hmm. while Hadley has about 5,300 people, the amount of traffic that flows down your route is? Uh, we recently did, uh, we recently reached out to MassDOT because we were really trying to get an accurate number because when you look at Route 9, we hear a lot of the We've seen a lot of the studies that they've done in the past, and you hear numbers anywhere from 30,000 to 80,000 people driving up and down Route 9, but that's just Route 9. If you sit anywhere in town and you just watch where all the cars go, a lot of them are going up Rocky West Street, Rocky Hill Road to go to UMass, or they're using Bay Road to go south, uh, and so MassDOT has traffic counters placed all around town. And they only turn them on for certain periods of time and in different areas. And what that does is it gathers information so that you can put together what they call an average daily annual estimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the average daily annual estimate for all of Hadley, not just Route 9, is over 110,000 vehicles. So there's a lot of folks coming through here <laughs> and coming to here to go shopping uh, and coming through to go to, you know, we're right in the center of the five college area. We're the only community uh, in, I think, Western Mass that has a Home Depot and a Lowe's in the same town. Uh, my understanding is I think we're the only place west of 495 that has a Trader Joe's and a Whole Foods. Um, so we have all these things that a lot of places don't have. So people will travel to Hadley from up to 30 to 45 minutes away to do their shopping. <laughs> Other thing I wanted, uh, you and I talked about a little bit yesterday, was your school resource officer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, because I was in education, I'm always wondering about the teaming between a police department and a school. So something happens in the school, and the school has to handle somebody with a knife, you know, or an assault. I was telling Mike, I knew of someone where, where the uh, had thrown a bottle, a plastic bottle, half full of water, broke the eye socket of another one. So I said uh, to Mike, how would you handle that? Does the school call you? So that's of interest to me. I don't know if it's of interest to you, but what's the teaming? Yeah, Yeah, the teaming is critical. It's mm -hmm. literally the most important part. We don't want our officers to be disciplinarians working at the school. That is not the goal. Uh, the goal is to offer coaching, offer mentoring, uh, offer education to try to, you know, befriend these kids before, you know, before those things happen. Um, and uh, so, you know, working closely with the school, the, the staff knows these kids better than anyone. So working with them and, and being able to take, uh, take information from them so that mm -hmm. we know how, to, how best to handle the situation. If this is a kid in crisis... The last thing we want to do is be putting handcuffs on them. Yeah. So that's really kind of the, the it, like as, when I say it's critical, I mean it is absolutely critical that we are uh, we work close with the school staff and we know what's going on. Mm -hmm. The loss of your school resource officer must be huge then it for is. you. It is, unfortunately. Um, sergeant Mike Romano is the, uh, he's the sergeant who actually started our school resource officer program when I became chief. We'd never had one before. Uh, he built the program from the ground up and uh, has been working with the schools ever since the start. He moved out of the school resource officer program. We identified a couple of other people in the, over the course of the last few years who just loved it, jumped into it with both feet, um, thought it was fantastic, and unfortunately both of them have, <laughs> have since left the agency. Um, one of them was, uh, was one of my female officers, was the most recent one, who went to uh, the state police. And she's doing phenomenally now in the state police, but uh, Mike, unfortunately, is left to kind of do double duty, and it's just not, You're lost. we just don't have enough time to, 
to do what we really want to do right now. So you're going to be doing some interviewing, I assume, to get yes. people. And you've been talking uh, around, I think, your own philosophy mm -hmm. of policing. And I wonder if you would share with us how you look at policing. Um, disciplinarian? No, at the school. Right. Talk about uh, what, what are you looking for when you interview <clears throat> for those places? We're looking for character. Okay. We're, looking for, uh, we're looking for officers with good character. When I first started, we had a lot of financial difficulties in the department. We had a lot of overspending in the overtime uh, area because we were just um, mismanaging how that was supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of pressure was put on me by the, the select board and also you know, by, by myself as, far, as part of my responsibility to get that under control. Mm -hmm. And so hiring of officers, uh, what I was encouraged to really do was find the cheapest person you can hire. And the cheapest person is the person who's already trained and already works somewhere else. Unfortunately, you have to pick from what that is. And sometimes, you know, people develop bad habits or they just weren't a good person or a good fit for the career, for the profession in the first place. And so while it was an inexpensive hire, mm -hmm. it wasn't the best person for the job. And so what we do now is we go out and we look for the person who is the best human being that we can find. And we will hire them and we will teach them how to be a police officer. It takes a little bit longer than anyone else, uh, people who are already trained, but it is well worth it in the end. Uh, and um, it's, it's rewarding for the rest of the department to see that this person is not only a good human being, but they're a great fit for the agency because all of the rest of them are the same type of person. Mm -hmm. And they don't always work out. We can't always teach everybody how to become a police officer. Uh, but that's the risk that you take when you go out there and you look for good people as opposed to fully trained officers. Now, the hope in the future, uh, if we can, and someone referenced it earlier about the, the, uh, the letter that was in the Gazette mm. about wages and things like that. The goal in the future is to raise the wages so that we can poach <laughs> from other agencies. But if the wages are competitive enough, that pool of people that we'll be looking for we can afford to take our time and really find the best of the best character-wise, mm -hmm. and then we'll go from there. Do you have a sense that the people who have been poached from you were looking for something different? Were looking for, was it wages? Was it? It was wages. It was wages. It was wages. It really was. They um, all moved into yeah, higher paying I, jobs. I wish you had said something. I could actually have brought the resignation letters with you because all of them wrote it right in their resignation letter. Um, I, it's 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 unfortunate we did we made some really great strides two contracts ago with these officers to try to play some catch up because mm -hmm. everyone else around was continuing to raise their wages but here in Hadley we were just kind of going status quo mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we made some great strides but we just didn't get far enough and so now right now we're in contract negotiations and we have an opportunity to really take care of these officers and really get competitive mm -hmm. with the other departments around us. And with the new police reform bill and the post requirements, yeah. um, we are all competing. All of these police agencies now are all competing for this same ever-shrinking pool of qualified police officers. And so- Interesting, why ever-shrinking? <sighs> nobody wants to be a police officer anymore. Nobody wants to be a teacher anymore. We have the same problem. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, <laughs> or a nurse, right? Exactly. Or a nurse. Uh, the fire department is having the same problems. Yep. Uh, they're, you know, the 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 pool of folks who who they would be would be looking at is just getting smaller and smaller. Yeah. And so, you know, unless you can show certain things within your agency or within your town uh, that are attractive to people, mm -hmm. and when I look at those things, I think wages. We are, uh, right now, we're in what's called a self-assessment phase, going towards accreditation, which I'm sure you know about being, a, being a, uh, in education. Yes. Um, this is the pinnacle of, uh, of uh, best practices in law enforcement. Generally speaking, uh, really 
only larger departments try for these kinds of things because it is a lot of work to ensure that you are um, that you are accredited and we're in the self-assessment phase right now so when I think of officers younger officers out there who are looking to jump ship from some other place yep. they're gonna look at what do you pay and what is the status of your organization and if we can say that the status is we are an accredited professional organization I feel like that's going to garner the best possible candidates uh, that's great great um, I want to talk a little bit about you um, you are not a Hadley boy no ma'am <laughs> tell us about your upbringing and how you got to sure. this point sure um, well, I, I have worked in Hadley for uh, for over 20 years now but I recognize that, that does not by any stretch <laughs> make me a Hadley boy um, I've actually spent probably more time in this town than I have in my own uh, over the years working here uh, but uh, I grew up in Waitley. Um, my parents built a house there uh, back in the 80s, I believe. And uh, I went to Waitley Public Schools, and then I went to Frontier Regional for a junior high and high school. My wife went to uh, Sunderland. She lived in Sunderland, and she went to Sunderland Public Schools. Mm -hmm. We actually first... I don't want to say met each other because you don't really meet each other at this age, but uh, we met at catechism classes in uh, probably, what, third or fourth grade wow. CCD classes. Yeah. Um, and I remember actually liking her friend as opposed to her. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we didn't know each other Fickle at all. Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then in uh, junior high and high school, I, uh, I did my, my, uh, my level best to uh, try to make her my high school sweetheart. She was having none of it. <laughs> and it took me until uh, sophomore or junior year in college. I went to Westfield State. It was Westfield State College at the time. It hadn't yet gone university. Mm -hmm. She was going to UMass Amherst. Uh, and uh, that's when we started dating. So it's been 25 or so years together. We've been married for almost 19 you just passed the husband test. Yeah. You knew the years. I did. I, I, well, I, if I had, I, I'm not, if I just, if I can be honest, I was actually on the treadmill this morning doing the math in my head to make sure that I got it right. Um, so, yeah, we've been married for almost 19 years. We have, uh, I have a daughter who is 13. Uh, she goes to Frontier. She's in junior high. She has her first real boyfriend, which makes this job seem easy. <laughs> How's uh, it going, pops? <laughs> uh, it's all right. He's a good kid. I, I can't. I can't say anything bad Thank about him. He's a good that. kid. Does he know you were a cop? He does. He does. <laughs> he does. I've actually, I've actually uh, had to pick her up. He lives uh, in Sunderland, like almost exactly on the way home uh, uh, when I leave work, and so I've had to stop and pick her up a couple times. And I made sure I pulled in the driveway and accidentally turned the strobe lights on. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, no, he's all right. And my son, uh, Riley, is uh, nine right now, and he's going to Waitley Public Schools and uh, starting, he actually started baseball this week. So everything is uh, going little, well with our, upsetting. with home life, yes. Good. Talk to me about uh, what the issues, the major issues you feel like you face, both currently and in the future, if you can. What's happening that's big? Well... I think you alluded to it in the beginning when you were talking about how folks uh, might not necessarily see that same, they might not necessarily have that same connection with police officers that you may have when you were younger. Yeah. That uh, friend type person who would, you know, come over to your house and, and, you know, walk in your front door and, you know, this was a friend to you. My, um, as I mentioned to you the other day, when I graduated from the police academy almost 20 years ago now, my academy director, uh, her father was actually the chief of police in Agawam, which is where both of my parents grew up. And he was exactly what you described. He would show up at their house, uh, bring them fireworks, you know, bottle rockets they could shoot off. And uh, my father and his brothers loved... Um, they loved digging in the dirt and, and messing around and doing crazy stuff and the chief would actually come over to their house and shoot bullets into the ground so that they could dig up the bullets and so it sounds a little <laughs> weird but this is this was the relationship that yeah. they had yeah uh, and so that's that's one of the bigger issues right now and that's one of the reasons why we 
try to hire the people that we hire mm-hmm. because while I want them to be protectors and I want them to uh, be able to deal with the bad guys that they run into, we run into occasionally in this town, I more want them to stop at the farm stand down the road and say hello mm-hmm. or walk into Cumberland Farms and get a coffee and stay for five minutes and just say hello to anybody that comes in the door. Mm-hmm. And right now you have a department full of people over there who are willing to do stuff like that and want to do stuff like that. But the issue is the culture change, right? So it's, I can, I can work on one side of it. You know what I mean? I can, I can, I can try to hire differently and find the right people who want to do that. And so we can put them out in the public and we can, try to have them create these relationships and bridge these gaps that are that are there right now uh, but the struggle is whether or not it's reciprocated whether sure. or not folks really want to support the police or actually want that friend any longer uh, mm-hmm. so that's that's one of the bigger struggles that we have right now mm-hmm. crime is crime okay we understand it there was um, discussion on the select board last night about um, uh, the housing, affordable housing, mm. and there was some comments that some of the you know some of the folks were making. Well, what is the effect on public safety? Uh, this this is going to have it's going to bring crime to town and all this other stuff. Well, okay, that's our job. Okay, okay, so they get more calls that they have to go to. It is what it is. If the town decides that they want to bring in tax revenue or they want to offer affordable housing to folks, then that's what we'll deal with. Mm-hmm. That's our that's our job. Okay. So that's that's the easy stuff. <laughs> in line with that, you've got a department of, what would you say, 11, 15, 16 people? About 20 if you include the part-time folks. How many live in Hadley? Only a handful. I would say maybe two or three. Uh, one of them uh, used to, Mitch Mitch actually used to live right on the S-curve up, up north, and he, mm-hmm. he actually moved out of Hadley, but he's only out of Hadley by about a mile. <laughs> <laughs> Stay close. Uh, but yeah, and not, uh, not as many as, as we used to have. Do you think that's because, well, we're on affordable housing, do you think that they would live in Hadley if they could afford to, or is it just that because you're looking for character, because you're looking for a particular kind of Mm -hmm. police officer who's willing to connect, that you've got to go broader? You do. I think that's exactly correct. Um, One of the things that I have really high hopes for our new uh, HR director is that she can help us with recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, she has some strategies that she briefly explained to us that I am very excited to look at because not only do we need to find character, but we also need to look like the community that we serve. We need to be more diverse. Okay. okay. Um, one of the unfortunately, one of the officers that I lost, I lost two, uh, two, uh, two of our Hispanic officers. So the only two officers we had that spoke Spanish. One left and went to the state police. The other left and went to Chicopee. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily enough for us, the, the other one, actually, we just hired him back last night, but we hired him back in a part-time capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I have a couple. Of, I had a couple of female officers. We did lose one. I'm hoping to hire another female officer mm-hmm. uh, in the coming months. But diversity, you know, mm-hmm. we, I want to be able to kind of cast that net wide mm-hmm. and find the best of the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right that it, it is because we have to look wider. We do have, you know, one, one of the newest officers we have does live right here in Hadley. We found a great one right here on, you know, right here in town. So uh, every once in a while you get lucky. But, uh, <laughs> but that's uh, what it is. That's it's what fun. it is. It is, you know. It's just a, a select few folks. Okay. I want to talk for a minute. Mike, uh, when he and I were discussing all of this in our preliminary get to know each other, uh, he talked about something called the citation study. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you all know about the citation study? You read the headlines. Maybe. Maybe. Well, what is it? Um, How do we fare in Hadley? And what's been the response from you all to that? So first of all, what's the citation study? Okay. So uh, in 2019, uh, there was a bill that was called the Hands-Free Driving Bill. you um, You may know about it. Uh, basically, it was a driving bill that requires that you can't have your cell phone in your hand anymore. You have to have it on a, you know, down. Within that bill, the legislature wanted to add a annual citation study to investigate whether or not police officers were acting with biases. 
to pull cars over, write tickets, arrest people, things like that. They wanted to gather this information. And so there was a lot of heavy discussion as to how they were going to do this. What is the study going to consist of? Um, and unfortunately, from what we know right now, we didn't know then, is that there is no real good way to do this when you're talking about 351 different communities with different populations, with different demographics. Okay. Uh, and so, I don't want to say it fell on deaf ears, but the legislators wanted this study done. And so, what they wrote into the law was that every year, the registry will collect all of the citations written by every single community in the state. And the, the state will then select a nonprofit organization, such as a college or something like that, usually the, the statistical department, to do some type of study. Okay. There are a couple of different studies out there that, um, that can be done. One of them is called a driving population estimate study. This was a study that was done back in 2004. And essentially, what that study did was it tried to get information to figure out who was driving through your community. It was the closest thing that they had to understanding the demographics of what was going through your town. That's not the study that they did this time around. Okay. This, this time they're looking for bias? They're both looking, they both they're were both looking, looking for bias, but there's just different metrics that they used okay. to gather the information. Gotcha. And so this one, this, is, this study was actually called a veil of darkness study. <laughs> And Sorry. so what, what veil of darkness means is this. All things being equal, if police officers are pulling over non-white motorists more in the daytime than they are at night, hmm. it is likely because they can see the driver and they may be stopping them based upon the color of their skin. So you can see that I had a problem with that right <laughs> off the bat because that to me sounds a little biased. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it is what it is. And so... The strange part about the study is that had they looked at all of our citations throughout the entire 10 months of the study, they would have found nothing. They would have found that the Hadley Police Department does not stop non-white motorists more in the daytime than they do at night. Okay. But that's not how they do the math. The math is actually done during certain time frame periods that they pluck out between sunrise and sunset. Okay. And so I don't know why they do this. I don't, I don't understand it. I am on a first name basis with the head researcher at this point because we have communicated so much because so I've tried to learn and understand what, how they gathered this information. And I still don't understand why they only look at those two yeah. time frames. Yeah. But what they found was that within those two time frames, we stopped 47 non-white drivers and 262 white drivers. So about a fifth, almost about 20%. There you go. And if you do the math on that, over the course of 10 months, that's four non-white drivers per month that were pulled over with 110,000 cars driving through. Sounds good to me. I thought that too. <laughs> Unfortunately... What they determined was of those 47 non-white drivers, when compared to the five times more white drivers, apparently within those time frames, we stopped non-white drivers more. Is that in comparison to the other 250 towns or nope, whatever? No, they, they just do it within your own community. It's just within your own, right. okay. And so I ask questions like, Okay, well, do you know the demographics of folks who are driving through the communities within those time frames? No, we don't. Uh, do you know, does it matter that only 47 people were pulled over as opposed to five times that number mm -hmm. of white drivers? Do you factor that in at all? No, we don't. That's for you to factor in. That's <laughs> for you to decide. And I said, okay, so let me get this straight. You're condemning me in the newspaper, and all you're really doing is asking me to look at these numbers deeper? And she said, that's it. That's it. That's basically it. it. Yeah. And so one of the things that the study looked at was what they call outcomes. And outcomes mean 
warnings, citations, criminal citations, arrests, searching of people, okay? okay? We were below state averages in every single one of those categories. We were below state averages in stopping non, in actually pulling over non-white motorists and the, we were below all the rest of the state averages in all of those categories, including non-white motorists. We live in a community that is approximately 95% white. Okay. It's a 95, the last one I saw, I think, um, Jane was at the, I, I actually, what we did was is we spent more than a month, almost every single day, pulling the exact data that they were talking about. We actually requested to get the data from them, and we were refused six different times. I was just told the other day, the day before we did the presentation for Jane and, and several other folks, they said, we think we can get you the data now. I said, that's great. I don't need it now. <laughs> I needed it then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I still don't have it, uh, but they said that they can get it to us. Uh, so what we did was is we did it ourselves. We looked at we pulled it all of our all ourselves. We had to we had to spend so much time on this. It got to the point where we had to look up the exact time of the sunrise and the sunset oh. for every day in a ten month period, so that we could know which one of those stops was on daylight side or nighttime side. That's how much work we had to put in, and we found essentially the exact opposite of what was reported in the newspaper. And so I have been reaching out to the state because the other half of the law says if any town or city is found to be biased mm -hmm. now that's not what they said they didn't say that we were biased they simply said there's a disparity here we think you should look deeper in it but we all know that that's not what what it says in the newspaper <laughs> so if they they said that there there somebody will look into it the attorney general's office or you know the secretary of public safety and if they determine there's bias then there'll be consequences. I don't want to say punishments because it's not really a punishment. What they said was is you will have to attend uh, bias-free <laughs> policing training or yeah. and or you'll have to kind of collect more data again. So, as I mentioned to you the other day, we do some type of anti-bias or bias-free policing or restorative justice or uh, fair and impartial policing training almost every single year since I've been the chief. Yeah. So we already do one of the consequences annually. And the other consequence is essentially collecting the data. And essentially what that comes down to is, is I told, I, I've told the state, I said, if you're going to do the exact same study every single year and gather it the same way, we're going to end up on the list again. Mm -hmm. But they're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to fix your study. Well, you told me that 13 flaws, do I remember that? There are 11, 11, 11. flaws, yeah, they did a, it's a 450 page report. And there's about 200 pages of text and then about 350 pages of, um, of uh, data, just numbers. One for every single community in the um, state. And so uh, what they did in the report was they listed strengths and weaknesses. These are the folks who actually designed the study and wrote this report. And they have three strengths listed and 11 weaknesses listed. There are 11 reasons to not <laughs> use this study. And the three strengths they listed, only one of those strengths actually has to do with the actual data. The rest of it is superfluous to that. <laughs> and so it's, those are the kinds of things that make this job so hard to do. Uh, because there are police officers, I'm certain, out there who act on bias. We all have unconscious biases, right? Yeah, absolutely. The idea is to identify them and ensure that you're not acting on them. So we know everyone has biases. There are likely officers out there who are doing this. But if you're not going to do a study that actually finds it, if you can't do a study, you don't have a way to do it yet, then maybe we shouldn't be simply reporting this type of thing in the newspaper based upon some uh, a study that has more flaws than you know. I actually said to one of the uh, one of the 
uh, folks from EOPS, the Executive Office of Public Safety. Um, they were the ones in charge of finding the college to, uh, to do the study. I said, you know there's 11 flaws to this study? I said, how many do you need before you say, maybe we shouldn't release this? Do you, do you need a baker's dozen I mean, <laughs> before you stop? Yeah. And he said, I, I can't, I know, I know, I can't. There's nothing I can do. It's written into the law. And so next week, I think it's next week, not next week, the week after, I am actually going to do the same presentation that I did uh, for Jane and for several other department heads uh, in town. I'm going to do the exact same presentation for Senator Comerford and uh, State Rep. Carey uh, and their staff. And because I want them to understand that it's important for people within this community to trust the officers who work here. And I want them to know that. I want them to see the numbers because I'm certain that they saw the newspaper article. I've spoken to both of them on it. And so I said, we spent a lot of time on this. I want you to come see this. They were supposed to come to the library a couple of weeks ago, but they got held up in Boston. They care enough to have made uh, an appointment. So on the 20th, I yeah. think it is, they're going to come and I'm going to do the exact same presentation for them because that is the most important thing that the folks in this town and around us trust us. There's a really very real fear out mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. about officers acting on bias, officers doing things they're not supposed to be doing. It's been all over the media for quite a while now. Yes, so it has. Everyone gets tired. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mike, is there anything that you want to cover or let folks know? I think that's a wonderful round ending yeah. because that says what you want. Yeah. But uh, you all may have questions or Mike has something else that we haven't covered. So let's open it to more of a round table. Anyone? Well, how long I you been chief? I said everything you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> how long you been chief, Mike? I just passed my seven year anniversary. Um, a couple, uh, I think it was last, it was last month. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember that it was in March because my very first day as <laughs> chief of police, <laughs> yeah. Very first day uh, was uh, the very first Blarney blowout at uh, oh, Mass. It's my very first day, and I remember I remember hopping in a I remember hopping in a cruiser with one of my supervisors and driving around and seeing thousands of kids wearing green, drinking beers, you know, throwing beer cans in people's lawns, and I thought it's going to be a real short career. It's gonna be great, it's going to be one day and out. Um, yeah, and so it's uh, it's it's a very stressful job, uh, not just being a police officer, but but being the chief. But uh, it's very rewarding, and it's the reason that I've I've stayed as long as I I have, and I intend on uh, hopefully retiring here someday. Um, I was gonna say you're not leaving us, are you? <laughs> I'm not leaving. No, I'm not leaving. I uh, I am uh, I'm about to finish my master's degree. Ah, congratulations! And so I'm just trying to kind of expand my horizons. I've been working on it for a while. The select board wanted me to get uh, my master's when I first started. So I was, you know, when I, when I first came on board, they said, fix the overtime problem, um, try to, you know, be less expensive in, in as many areas as you can and uh, keep getting an education. Uh, so I really appreciated the education part. The overtime problem really, that was, uh, that was an interesting one to that fix. A but a lot of that, a lot of the repairs and the overtime came from the fact that I have worked every position that our department has. I started as a part-time dispatcher more than 20 years ago. Uh, I then you know, worked as a special police officer. We have two levels of part-time uh, policing. One is an entry-level officer, which is called a special. And then we have what we generally call just a part-time police officer. I did both of those jobs. Then I was hired as a full-timer, and then I got promoted by Chief Huckowitz to sergeant. And so when I became chief, everyone knew that our relationship had to change slightly, but because they knew that there was nothing that they could say that they do that I didn't already do, there was a trust there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they trusted me to make the right moves with the agency. I was able to convince the select board that we needed more personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, and the officers knew that with more personnel, would come less overtime. Yes. And so they were willing to make that trade because they trusted that I wasn't going to take from them. 
Uh, and that's really kind of how I how I operate. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody does wrong, they pay the, they get it. Pay the price. Uh, they pay the price. Uh, and uh, if uh, in any other circumstance, they know that I'm going to stand behind them if they did the right thing. And um, and that's really kind of what made it you know made me successful in fixing that overtime problem. And knock on wood, if that's real wood. We haven't we haven't uh, overspent our overtime budget in one single year since I've been the chief. Congratulations was able to fix on it that almost too. immediately. What's your master's in? It's in uh, it's in criminal justice, but okay. it's with a uh, with a, a specialty in uh, uh, criminal justice agency management. Oh, okay. So your essentially, job. what I'm doing. Your job, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the good part about it is that I'm actually taking quite a few classes that have to do with emergency management. Mm -hmm. And so the fire chief has been nagging me for several years now to try to get the same certifications that he has as our emergency management director so that we can split the duties, Share. so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> so he gets to sleep? Well, yeah. well it'll do, it depends. We're going to flip a coin for that one. But uh, You so, were out at Vesta, the Vesta, I assume, at yep. midnight. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I... A lot of my classes, as well as some of the classes that I've taken through, um, you know, through the organization, uh, have gotten me all the certifications that I need to be able to do that, and mm -hmm. even more. Um, I was kind of surprised at some of these. Oftentimes, when you take core classes and things like that, you know, uh, in college, they're not really applicable to what your yeah, degree is in. I know. <laughs> but uh, this this master's program has actually uh, really been helpful in a lot of different areas. That's great. Yeah. Where are you taking? It's all online right now, and I'm doing ah, a UMass okay. Lowell. Okay. Yeah. okay. Jane, is there uh, anything that we haven't covered that you Only think... Only how thankful the town is that you're our police chief. <laughs> well, I am, uh, I'm thankful to, uh, to be the police chief here. I don't... Um, I've spent my entire career here, so yes. I can't necessarily say that, uh, you know... I can't say, oh, well, I worked over in Amherst, and it's way better. What I can <laughs> tell you is this. Um... The officers who have come and even gone uh, working in this town will, if I run into them, they will often say that this was one of their favorite places to work. Nice. And I'm sure some of it has to do with who their coworkers are and, and uh, you know, working at that department, but a lot of it has to do with the community that they work for. Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, you know, they, some of the officers, I, I'm friends with some of the officers in Northampton, some of the higher-ups, the captains and things like that, and they've been really kind of put through the ringer over the course of the last couple of years, and uh, that is a very different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so even though I feel like, I feel like it, within this community, even though there are outliers, there are always going to be people who do not like the police no matter what. Yes. Understandable. It's like being an umpire in baseball. If you say safe, somebody's going to be mad at you. <laughs> if you say out, it's the other ones. Um, but I think for the most part, people feel supported here. Mm -hmm. People feel liked. They feel like uh, the community wants them here. Not they're, that they're not a burden. They're not a necessary evil, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I've always felt. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why I've never left spent my whole career here so um, you grew up here basically yeah in your career I started uh, I mean geez I think I was 20 22 really? 22 years old somewhere fresh around out of yeah. mm -hmm. I was doing uh, I worked at, at architectural timber uh, and mill work up on Mount Warner Road I was going to college full-time commuting to Westfield and working as a part-time dispatcher all at the same time and uh, Chief, Huck, that's where I, Chief Huckowitz took a liking to me because I saved him a ton of money in overtime. <laughs> because any time they called me, I would take the shift, and that was before the full timers were allowed to get the shifts. So uh, they'd call me at ten o'clock at night and say, "We need you here at 11. and I would just get up and go in go. because I would have done the job for free. <laughs> but and you know, it wasn't once I until I arrived that I was thinking to myself, "Boy." I don't know how I'm going to handle tomorrow. I got to work in the morning, then I got to go take a, an exam in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I didn't really think ahead a lot back then. But. <laughs> I do remember you, the other day when we were talking when you first decided you were going to be a policeman or wanted oh, to be a policeman. Yes. 
Uh, I was probably six or seven, maybe eight years old, somewhere around there. We were, um, I was with my grandparents and my mother, and we were in a car traveling back from Florence to our house in Waitley. And we came upon a big pickup truck on the side of the road, right where those big reservoirs are in, um, uh, right, out, right outside of Florence, if you're heading towards, towards Waitley, there's a huge, beautiful reservoir right on the side of the road, and it's a, there's no houses, yeah. no nothing around. And there was a pickup truck on the side of the road, and I remember being so small, I had to kind of look up to see what was going on, and I, we wa- I was watching a domestic violence incident happen right on the side of the road. There was a large man, uh, and he was uh, abusing a smaller woman. And my grandfather was, was older, my grandparents were both older at the time, and uh, he wasn't going to be able to do anything. So what they did was is they just kind of sped past and went to the first house to call the police. Um, and I remember spinning around in my seat and watching, and that image of what was going on is, was seared in my memory. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember being so angry that, you know, I was seven or eight years old, I wanted to get out and fight him. Um, and uh, I, I look back on that time, and I am fairly certain that I never changed the fact that I wanted to become a police officer since then. <laughs> I wanted to be an astronaut before that or, you know, whatever. <laughs> but at that point was when I decided that, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is my life. Yep. Mike Mason, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.